hope you guys enjoyed that video um welcome to green cells monthly webinar again uh, we'll be starting our webinar in a few minutes please do follow us on facebook instagram and our on our recently launched website and stay informed on our upcoming events thank you Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Lata Krishnan. I am a green cell volunteer, and I will be one of your hosts for today. We also have Geeta Prabhakar on site at uh, Old Rucker Farm. Welcome to Green Cells Rainwater Harvesting Webinar at City of Alpharetta on Old Rucker Farm. Green Cell is a volunteer run nonprofit organization. We are very passionate about raising awareness of human created environmental issues and promoting conscious consumerism. As a part of our efforts, we run several community projects such as cleanup drives, food rescues, and recycling campaigns. Our objective is to help everyone to incorporate small and big green changes in our daily lives, which will go a very long way in reducing our negative impact on the environment and the natural world. Simply put, our aim is to help everyone go green. We conduct regular webinars on varied topics, ranging from composting, growing your own food, recycling right, hydroponics, sustainable energy, several areas where we can make changes to help reduce our carbon footprint. These webinars are held on the second Sunday of every month. For the next month's webinar on June 13th, we'll have our presenter Sasikant Velam. The topic for the webinar will be drip irrigation and automating the garden watering system. Now I'm going to hand it over to our host on site, Geeta, who is at the city of Alpharetta Old Rucker Farm with our speaker, Richard. Geeta, you can take it over. Thank you, Lata. Um, welcome everyone again to our Green Cells webinar of this month on rainwater harvesting. This webinar is just a little extra special because after a long time, we are actually having a webinar out in the open. And we do have a few people listening to us in, um, you know, right here with us. So um, we are right now at the Alpharetta uh, City's Old Rucker Farm. And uh, I need, you know, we chose this location because this is a location where uh, Richard, our speaker today, has recently installed a rainwater harvesting system. Uh, at the location and what better place than to show it to you right here where it's been done and it feeds the community gardens watering needs so I mean that's where we are and um, the other thing uh, before I go on to introduce our speaker is um, I need to thank Amanda Musli, who's the community services manager in the Alfreda City Odaka farm she most um, enthusiastically actually when I spoke to her about this uh, concept of having a webinar. She introduced us to Richard, she connected us, and then she also said you can use our venue. And then finally, she's actually, we are doing this webinar in partnership with uh, Amanda and the city. So Green Cell and uh, uh, the Old City Rucker Farm are happy to bring this webinar to you all today. Let me now just uh, introduce our speaker. He's um, an alumni of um, Georgia Tech and studied industrial and systems engineering. He has worked in this, uh, you know, in this field of water pressure through his entire career and obviously understands all the nuances of um, the rainwater harvesting needs, the effect of the torrential rains. And the, you know, we know that Atlanta especially has a lot of uh, rain. And uh, while rain is great, there are also the other side effects of rain that we have to watch out for you know, the flooding and the erosion. So those are the kind of things that uh, he has studied and he's going to share with us 
why rainwater harvesting is important and how we can all introduce this and implement it in our own homes just to help make this um, our efforts you know to use the natural resources more effectively uh, so without um, further ado let me go ahead and introduce our speaker and just before i give you the mic uh, richard i'm going to have to uh, go through certain um, business you know the housekeeping rules while we conduct our webinar uh, we would like to have all the all the attendees will be on mute so that we can hear richard clearly especially we are out in the open and we hear a lot of other noises so we'd like to keep this uh, make sure that we're all on mute if you have questions during the webinar uh, please feel free to uh, type up your questions in the chat windows we are live on zoom as well as on facebook and on youtube so whichever medium you're watching us on just uh, type in your questions there we have our volunteers who are manning all the systems and reading the questions and updating uh, it and collating it so we will get all your questions in front of richard and he will be more than willing to answer them to you to you um so and if for some reason you do not uh, get to have your questions answered or you think of something different later do email us at greencellatl@gmail.com you can find us on facebook and our website um and send us your questions and we we'll reach out to richard and you know help help you there uh once again a very warm welcome to you richard thank you geeta <laughs> thanks everyone thanks for coming or joining us um yeah as geeta said i am a georgia tech industrial engineer graduate i got into uh plum engineered plumbing sales and manufacturing uh from the beginning and about almost 11 years ago now i discovered this thing called rainwater harvesting and uh, um it was just a great fit between all of my experience and skills and what the market needed so um i owned a company at that time about 7 years ago now i sold it and started georgia water tanks and georgia water tanks is a business of uh we sell products so we we talked about installing it we did not actually install this we sold the products to a contractor we sell to homeowners um but mostly we sell to contractors who install these different uh projects or rainwater harvesting is our focus uh we do a little bit of other stuff we don't do um rain barrels particularly um and I'll go into some of the reasons for that as we go through the uh through the presentation so you're going to see some um some rain tanks that are much bigger than rain barrels and I'll explain again why we do that so I'm going to try and share my screen here. Yeah. Let me share that one right. Okay. All right. So start with and like you just said, um we we started this company with the premise that rainwater is not a problem that needs to be managed but it's a resource and after air it's the second most valuable resource on earth so we like to treat it that way okay so this is particularly about the rainwater harvesting for community gardens like this and for single family homes um rainwater harvesting in brief and um a little bit tongue in cheek description um we have this large reservoir of water that's just west of california called the pacific ocean <laughs> um and we we use all green energy to distribute it we use solar power to uh distill it make it perfectly clean um using solar power it evaporates um it goes into these large reservoirs that are above the earth we transport it by wind power and we deliver it almost every week to everywhere on the in the country um at least everywhere on the east coast we get about an inch of rain per week uh really everywhere east of the mississippi i ran some math and looked at the amount of rainfall that we get in georgia uh and altogether we get something like 14,000 gallons of water per person in georgia per day now If you look at your water bill, you use probably about 50 gallons per person per day, and there's about another 50 that you need for all the products that you buy and consume and that sort of thing. So, 
whatever that math is from 100 gallons that we need per person per day and 14,000 gallons that Georgia gets per person per day, that's how efficient we need to be in getting water to people. Um, it doesn't have to be very efficient. Um, a brief side, uh, side step to talk about some definitions that people use in this industry. You know, people have been using alternate water sources for some time. Um, we're talking about rainwater, which is specifically precipitation from the sky that falls on above ground impervious surfaces. So hard surfaces above the ground. So we don't have to worry about, um, you know, large amount of debris or dirt or pollutants other than whatever dust might accumulate on a roof. Stormwater is the same thing, precipitation, but that that hits the ground and runs off or parking lots or whatever. There's a little bit more dirt in that. Gray water is part of the water that you would have, um, you know, the wastewater that you would generate from your home. Um, so shower water and lavatory hand wash sink water would be considered gray water. Uh, black water is the sewage part of it that's tougher to treat. We can reuse all these different types of water, um, just depending on how much how much technology, how much energy you want to put into it. Um, you know, I mean, in this space station, they drink everything, okay, everything. <laughs> but we don't need to do that. There's, there's, we have so much water available to us in Georgia that if we just use, you know, the the water that hits the roof for non-potable uses on most properties, it would be all the water that we need. Um, so why do this? Um, what we've seen over the past few years is that, you know, we get into trouble when there's droughts in the Atlanta area. We get into trouble when there's a heavy rainstorm in Atlanta. We can't manage either, <laughs> feast or famine. Um, and rainwater harvesting can help with that. Uh, if you live in a house that's more than, say, 10 years old, um, probably the water that, that hits your parking lot, that hits your driveway, that hits your roof, is allowed to run off the, um, you know, run onto your neighbor's property or into the street, into the storm drains, into the creeks, at whatever volume it happens to be. Um, today, those rules are different, and we're going to talk about that. But that just generates so much water when it's not even a hurricane that it causes floodings and creeks and rivers and that sort of thing. Um, another reason, I think there were some questions ahead of time that asked about drinking rainwater and that sort of thing. Um, we get into some parts of what, what I call independence, you know, people that want to be, that don't want to use that connection to the city wall. Um, it's not cost effective in most parts of the, of the country, but it is something that people want to do either um, because they want to or because they have to. So the rainwater that comes down, you can't really use it as drinking water. You could run some tests on it and uh -huh. it generally is safe enough to drink. Okay. Um, occasionally you can get bacteria growing in there, but if you follow the practices that I'm gonna show you, it keeps it rather clear. Okay. The next step is resiliency, okay. which is, you know, that water in that tank, you wouldn't wanna drink it, but if the water was down for a week, or a month or whatever, then it'd be a lot safer to drink that than some of the other water sources. Um, so independence is, you know, I never drink the city water. Resiliency is what happens if whatever happens. So we use that often. And the rain that's in these tanks is not, it's not treated. So we don't know that it's clean, mm -hmm. um, but it's pretty easy to, to treat it well enough to drink. Right. So. But mainly, we're, I'm going to talk today about how to use rainwater to comply with the stormwater management um, requirements that are now, um, you have to do them everywhere in the metro Atlanta area. You have to do stormwater management on any new building. Some parts of the metro area, if you do a renovation, then you also have to, what they call manage the stormwater. So there are multiple ways to do that. Uh, rainwater harvesting is often the cheapest way. It's not always, but it's often the cheapest way compared to some of the others. Okay. But it's the only one that has any sort of financial payback. If, okay. you're, if you're going to use water to water your lawn, to water your garden, uh, in commercial buildings, to flush your toilets, uh, if you know what a cooling tower is, the way mm -hmm. that they work is they evaporate water. 
So they use a lot of water. Right. If you're going to use water on your site for any of those, then rainwater harvesting is the only way to comply with these stormwater management requirements and get a financial payback. Huh. So there are statewide requirements for this. Um, the overall guidance comes from the Georgia EPD, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Environmental Protection Division that enforces all of the federal EPA requirements. Um, City of Atlanta has taken those general ones and written the best, I think, um, guidelines for stormwater management requirements. Um, and their, their practices work everywhere. They were, I mean, City of Atlanta had the biggest problem when it came to flooding and drought. So they were the first in this area to start requiring the stormwater management and to allow rainwater harvesting as one of those. Um, over the last year, 2020, all of the water departments and um, you know, watershed management areas in the Atlanta area and also the, the big, bigger cities in Georgia, Columbus, Macon, Savannah, Augusta, all had to both um, enforce these stormwater management codes and allow all these different methods of stormwater management to be used for that. So, so these are codes that are applicable for residential homes as well? Residential and commercial, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is some of the verbiage from those codes. Uh, City of Atlanta says not only new construction, but also additions that are more than a thousand square feet. So if you build, a, you know, an addition onto your house, you have to do this. And what they're trying to do in particular is the part that I've highlighted in red. Uh, generally, we're trying to reduce the volume of runoff mm -hmm. uh, of the first first inch of water. So that can get, uh, oh, and, and I, you see there the, the list of different ways to do that. Right. So that controls the flooding that we as ways would have. Right. House by house, this controls the flood. Right. So what you're supposed to do is capture that first inch. Mm -hmm. um, the math of that is one inch of rainfall in a, you know, a, sh a shed like this um, is one inch of rainfall on a square foot of impervious surface is 0.623 gallons of water. So if you're talking about managing stormwater for one of these, um, you know, for a building, I mean, if you got a thousand square foot house, you probably don't live in Alpharetta, but that'd be a 623 gallon um, tank. Um, most, you know, a bigger house might be 4,000, 5,000 square feet of footprint, mm -hmm. and sometimes they've got multiple floors. Right. So it gets to be, you know, thousands of gallons of storage in order to comply with that, that uh, stormwater management requirement. So from that, you also have to show that you're, that you're going to use the water in some applicable way. So, um, you know, if you're going to water your lawn, mm -hmm. then you need about an inch of additional irrigation per week from what the, you know, from what falls from the sky. Okay. More if you have fescue, less if you have Bermuda, but you need, you need a fair amount of water, which is why I don't talk too much about the 50 gallon rain barrels like you can see in the background there. It's, it's just not enough water to do much good. Now, if you've got just some containers like you see around in our background here, if you've got, um, you know, three tomato plants on your on your um, on your deck, and you want to put a 50 gallon rain barrel right there. That's great. Okay. There's kind of a good balance between how much we're going to consume and how much we can collect. Okay. So, but most of what we do is bigger stuff. And that's the reason for it. Right. Also, Home Depot sells rain barrels, and I don't want to compete with Home Depot. So. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. <laughs> so you know so uh vegetables um you know, vegetable gardens turf annuals all use about you know a half a gallon three quarters of a gallon per square foot you can look at how much turf you've got and that's how much storage you need for that coincidentally you know you're going to collect about a half a gallon to a gallon of rainwater mm -hmm. per square foot so when it comes to sizing tanks, my, my general rule is what I call the one to one to one ratio. Okay. So for every one square foot of your rooftop, you want 
Uh, it's good for irrigating about one square foot of turf or garden or whatever, and store about a gallon of about a gallon of storage. Okay. One square foot, one gallon, one square foot. And from there, you look at you know whatever what's available. You know, if you're looking at a tank like this, and you need, um, you know, you need 600 gallons, you can get a 500 gallon, or you can get a 750 gallon. They're not going to make okay. a 627 gallon one just for you. Right. <laughs> so, okay. so it gets down to you know what's kind of commercially available, but that one to one to one puts you in the right neighborhood. Okay. Okay. But this would be a problem with these big ones in our subdivisions with HOAs and things like that. Right. right? And I live in DeKalb County. I know nothing about HOAs, but I know that they want You're everything. You're a person. <laughs> <laughs> they want everything to look the same. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna maybe now's a good time to go. Yeah, this is a good time actually okay. to go to the to the camera. Yeah, and you can start wherever which okay. one you want to show us. Yeah, so typical it. collection tanks that that um that you're gonna see all together. You can see in the background, you see the the um, brick colored one. That's a 50 gallon rain barrel. Uh, and like I said, it's probably too small. It's certainly too small for the stormwater management compliance. Okay. You know, you'd need. 20 of those. Oh, okay. 40 of those. So these types right here is it's an above ground plastic tank. This is a cutout for demonstration. Okay. Um, <laughs> but these are very common for, you know, for one part of the house, 300 gallon, a thousand gallon, something like that. Okay. Um, these are the ones you think you're going to have trouble with home HOA, like HOA type HOA. stuff. Right. Yeah. So they, um, these are good and that they're inexpensive. Uh, they're, you've got to be more careful about where you put them, right. even just to get the water to flow there. Cause you know, we're not trying to, we're trying to not pump it. Oh, okay. Right. So there's no pumping then. Right. Okay. Well, there's pumping out of it, ah, out of it. but okay. getting it into it, ah. you know, we, we can't be, you've got to flow to it. And you know, that, so, that's the height of the So you think all the roof from the rooftop, all the um, ducts coming down yep. and get into this. Right. Okay. Um, what we what we do, and this is just just my company, so it's not an overall. Um, it may not apply everywhere, but this is one part of an underground tank, and we cut out the end of it here. It's normally fifteen hundred feet, uh, sorry, fifteen hundred gallons, fifteen feet. They go underground, and in this area, you know, three of these or four of these would all be tied together. Uh, to give you total house collection and enough water stored to water your whole lawn. So, but these are all this water is used for external for watering. It's not for the whole house itself. It's for the sorry, yes, not not for it's collecting off the whole house. Yes, it's it's enough water to irrigate the whole lawn. Lawn. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't know. Whole um, And so yeah. you said this goes underground. These go underground. Yeah, and you um you know you run your piping around the building and it'll go into usually two or three of these. We've done as many as five or six. It kind of you know depends on depends on how big the building is. Um, yeah, and they'll they'll all tie together and then a pump like that goes mm -hmm. right in the tank and it's powerful enough to irrigate you know to run an irrigation system uh, like you would typically see at a at a. So what is the cost here for these? Would you have a rough idea? Uh, I'd say in the neighborhood of, you know, for, for 6,000 gallons of storage. So that'd be for these, it's six or $7,000 for all okay. the equipment. And then you need a day of, you know, digging out, a, um, digging a big, big enough pit, you know, who, whatever contractor already has an excavator on site, they can, they do, can, the job. They can do the job. Right? Okay. Yeah. So, and then you tie it to the irrigation system. So, right. All right, um, so that's the different type of collection tanks that we took. Oh, and oh, my trusty one, one right here. The main one. <laughs> the one that we hope will uh, pass the HOAs. So this is an above ground tank, obviously, just like the others. Um, but it's galvanized steel and it's pretty. So um, if we get back to my slides and I can show you, you know, there are places where tanks like this are used not even as a water storage tank, uh -huh. just as decoration. Really? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, if you go north of here to uh, Beaver Toyota and Cumming, uh -huh. 
right one of our tanks is right out front as part of their it's like their decoration and it's they store their um their when they have serve hot dogs on saturday or whatever right that's where they store their grill <laughs> Interesting. yep but yeah it's right out front okay let me just stay on camera and i can probably do the rest of this all right so that's the tank and that's what everybody talks about the most um, let's talk a little about about the other components and how you get the water keep the water good because the water was I mean it was distilled water right so yeah. so the most important ask um, I guess link in the chain of all the water treatment is to keep leaves and debris out of these tanks so this one has a basket filter on the top like this, you can see you get a little bit of little bit of stuff in there like that. You probably get a little bit more in the fall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, where somebody's going to keep up with it, these are great. Um, they, uh, they, they they collect this amount of stuff, and but somebody needs to look at it on a regular basis. basis. We've done some of these um, same basket filter at some community gardens at elementary schools. We did a program okay. with Captain Planet, and I would say. Of the ones I've checked, mm -hmm. nobody's keeping up with. Nobody's it. keeping up with it. Yeah, so okay. it's a, it's too bad. So this right here is another screen. Uh huh. Um. Oh, look. So you see the screen on the top, and you see how it's slanted like this. So you terminate your um, your downspout above it, and the water hits that screen, and it filters out the leaves water goes in here and any leaves fall off of that and it's it's self clean oh so there's no you don't have to go up there and you don't have to go up there right okay <laughs> that's easier for you right, right. oh yeah <laughs> yeah so and they're and they're very affordable the only issue is you've got you know this one you only need one basically one basket filter per tank you need one of those really for each downspout okay. but but still they're they're fifty dollars hundred dollars right. on amazon so um so the next thing that we do let's go over here oh okay. this one here sure for the underground tank we have a little bit different type of filter and i brought some show and tell here oh, awesome so this is inside there already the water comes in this way the clean water comes you can see the screen there and the overflow goes this way this one is also self-cleaning. There's a the, the chamber, see how it's kind of shaped like this? Well, when you get a storm and the water comes in this way, the water kind of swirls like this. Okay. And any leaves that have caught on the screen um, overflow here. Okay. So, so the leaves get all that way. Okay. Right. There are four different companies that make something like this that's designed for underground or something like that that are self-cleaning. Um, they're all German for some reason. Mm -hmm. um but they all they all work a little bit different um ours is the best of course but you know <laughs> <laughs> yes but it, but anyway they all they all do something like that to use kind of the, the the effect of the water and the weight of the water to keep them clean okay so, so you got that on there all right so the next thing you can see see the black thing that's on see the pipe that goes down and then the black Wonderful. thing that holds right there that is uh, what we call a calming inlet. And what that does is it directs the water after it gets into the tank, it directs it both to the bottom of the tank uh -huh. and uh, it aims it, it discharges back up. So what's happening there is, you know, if there's any sort of debris that's settled on the bottom, mm -hmm. we don't stir it up again. Okay. That's one of the problems with these basket filter ones is the water comes in and it just falls all the way to the bottom, right? Right. So it's going to stir it up again if there's anything in there. So that one does not do that. Uh, so, also, or sorry, go ahead. So the water doesn't get collected in this big tank, or the water does. It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This tank, and this is a cutaway. This should right. be. This should you know, be that out, big. Out to, out to here. Right. Um, another thing that does is it brings the fresh water in at the bottom. And if they're not using the water, um, the overflow is at the top. So you get fresh water in, oh. your older, staler water goes out, and um, that water has just come down your downspouts and splashed around, right? Mm -hmm. So it's full of oxygen, it's full of air. 
Right. So you get newly oxygenated air of water coming, coming in at the in. bottom, which keeps all the, if there is any organic material, and there will always be a biofilm, you know, that slime that's underwater, mm -hmm. that, that's eating other organic material. So that helps keep the water clean okay. as long as it has oxygen. So wow. bringing that oxygenated water in there actually makes the water cleaner than it was when it got in there. So to oxygenate the water, it's just that it's moving and it's oxygenated. Right. Because yeah, just because it splashed down splashed the downspouts down. and right. all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Interesting. So, um, yeah, so the new water's in the bottom. Any old water would overflow then. Oh, I was going to tell you, I did a, um, I'm always looking for gadgets. And right. I found this, um, this water quality tester on Amazon for like $12. Uh -huh. So I was going to one of our job sites that has a, a huge metal tank, 24 foot in diameter. Mm -hmm. um, that they weren't using for some reason. I forget why. But I went over there just to, um, to see what was going on, try and get it working again. And just for fun, I tested it with my new Amazon device. New device today. <laughs> um, like the standard for um, drinking water, it's measuring total dissolved solids. Okay? Um, the standard is you want to have a no more than a 100 of whatever that unit is for drinking water. So I put all the stuff in a cup and stuck it in there and the probe read zero. Oh. Well, I don't, maybe this is another cheap thing on Amazon that doesn't right. work, right? So I went <laughs> over into the, um, into the bathroom and put some water in a cup from the lavatory. Uh -huh. It was 150. Really? <laughs> so the rainwater, based on that, you know, that one That's aspect like of water quality, the rainwater was cleaner than the city water. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> but still you need to disinfect. <laughs> but it was and it was just doing the same thing. It was going through one of these filters, mm -hmm. goes all the way to the bottom. They weren't using it. You know, if there was any way for it to go stale, it would have. Right. But just because of this kind of piping, it stays fresh. So let's say there's enough rain just to fill the quarter of the tank. Mm -hmm. So that water gets still pumped up and used or uh, and it doesn't yeah, rain yeah, for because the because the, cause the the pump is at the bottom of the tank. Okay, okay. So it does keep getting pumped up. Right. So it's not like water stays there. No, we can use it until, I mean, this pump is like three inches off the bottom. Oh, but okay. There, it comes as close as anything to using it all, but that's one of the, Excellent. one of the things that I've looked for is pumps that use as much water as you can without having to shut up. Right. All right. Um, This one has a little bit different pump, but same sort of thing. There's got to be some sort of controller on it. You don't want to have to be turning the pump on and then remembering to turn it off. Right. So all these will have some sort of automation to, um, to make sure that they pump when you want to and, and don't okay. pump when you don't. This type um, would be connected to just this hose bib here. Mm -hmm. You turn on the hose bib, the pressure drop, the pump starts. This one has the same sort of thing, except the they're using this hydrant over here. So that may be. So then the, the only question I had was now the how do you get water into the whichever cistern you're using, whichever tank you're using. So all your rainwater ducts have to be directed. Right. To yeah, this. and that's the, you know, it's a simple concept that water runs downhill. Right. But it's the most um, challenging part, or certainly the most unique part of every project is where am I going to put this big tank mm -hmm. and how am I going to get the water to flow there by gravity without having to pump something and have exactly. another sump and that sort of thing. So these are great when it comes to cost, but you kind of have to put them where they have to go. Okay. And if you've got HOAs to worry about, I think you said that you can put stuff in your backyard. Front yard, definitely. Maybe. Definite no, no, but backyard, <laughs> maybe, but it has, can't be seen from the front. Okay. You know, it should not be visible. I know that for sure. And... <laughs> Yeah, unless but I think this, I mean, at least it doesn't, it could probably gel with the house. I mean, I'm, well, if you have a corner that you can tuck it away. Mm -hmm. from yeah, the, I think the strategy needs to put it right out front <laughs> and have five or six of them. <laughs> then it's a feature. <laughs> yeah. So from that aspect, that's the, that's the challenge of these type of above ground tanks is getting that water to flow there. It's a two story house. It's a lot easier. Right. It's a one-story house, and it's pretty challenging. Right. Um, 
the underground ones are easier in that aspect that you that you can you know you can flow it underground you can bury that tank four feet in the ground mm -hmm. so you know you can run the water a long way and and um and collect the water in the tank you have to dig out 1700 yeah. gallons of dirt and figure out what to do with them that's but that's but from a you know from a engineering standpoint that's that's what makes those easier okay well, let me ask you this then from a standpoint of being viable for a you know homeowner like us mm -hmm. where we haven't gone down this path at all right if we start with a rain barrel i mean most of us would like i've got a rain barrel from here right here mm -hmm. but i haven't installed it yet but it's there that would be my first step that i would take towards this effort so what is the things i can do because I mean, it is at least getting me introduced to the concept. Sure. Getting my feet wet. Yeah, I, start, I started with a five gallon bucket underneath, okay. my, underneath the downspout. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I just. I think we've all done that. <laughs> I know one of the other green cell volunteers here yep. definitely has done that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's for if you've got just some some containers that need water, if you've got, um, you know, my, I used mine when I was growing in parts of my my backyard right that was a good source of water exactly and i also had a creek it was a lot easier to get the stuff out of there than to crawl into the creek um but you know but if i it, had a you know because i've got this uh, white translucent uh, mm -hmm. water bottle it's mm -hmm. not the red one so right. what are the things that we have to look out for when it comes to a rain battle okay yeah the, so the the rain barrel is typically 50 gallons okay. and it's it's designed to be a rainwater storage uh, vessel so it's generally opaque right. um, even if it looks kind of brick colored like this they can put a layer of um a black plastic in between there so it so it blocks the light okay so it should not have light going through. <laughs> right i, I, I mean it, the, the only two challenges with a rain barrel like that are You've got a basket filter like this, so uh -huh. you need to be sure to change that. And it's 50 gallons, so it's not going to do, it's not going to do a lot. It'll do something. Yeah. It won't do a lot. Um, and, I, and I always say with tanks, you know, if it, if it, if you run out and it overflows, mm -hmm. then you could use a bigger tank. If you never, right. if you've got a 50 gallon rain barrel and you never run out of water, it's big enough. Yeah. For you. Okay, <laughs> that's true. That's. Um, so, but the, the white one there, these are pretty common, I think. Uh, that's called a, an, an IBC, which is a short for in, Intermediate Bulk Container. Okay. Uh, they're 275 gallons. You see those a lot in these community gardens. But the problem with it, you can see from here, you see the darkness in it. Yeah. So a translucent tank like that um, does not block the light. And when water sits in there, it's going to grow algae. And that's going to clog up the pump. And that's going to clog up the sprinkler. Is there something on uh, not on mute in the viewers? When she was small. Honey, can we have everybody muted, please? When my teacher was small, uh, her grandfather like um, used to be cleaning the All right, we're done. All right, so the problem with any of these translucent you. ones, like your one, sorry, right. <laughs> is that it doesn't block the light. First of all, it doesn't block the light. Okay. Second, they typically have a very small connection. Right. So, you know, you can get, you, you can overwhelm that pipe and you can spray water everywhere pretty easily. Okay. Uh, and the third problem with it is it's, well, if you, if you can just, if you're just trying to fill a, a bucket or something like that, then it would work fine. But you can't really get a pump down inside there and pump out of it. So, if you've got one, if you've already bought one or you have one and you want to try and use that, then I would say definitely find some black plastic and wrap it as um, you know completely. Right. That that'll prevent the water from going stale. Uh, and then as much as you can use this concept of bringing the water in at the bottom and letting the old water overflow right. at the top, mm -hmm. then the water will be fresher. Okay. Or just use it so fast that you don't have that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to do... Yeah, we're just going back to the presentation again. Now that we've had a wonderful look at all the um, water containers that we can fill up with the rainwater. Yeah, and now you've seen most of this. So, 
So these are the different types of collection tanks. We've already been over those. These are the manufacturers. Uh, you're going to make this presentation available later. Yes, okay. Absolutely. So they can go back and look at these manufacturers. Okay it, yeah. yeah, I'm fine with it. Um, this is one of those community gardens. The, 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 the tank on the right oh, okay. is one of the community gardens. It's near my house and it's one of those basket filters that, that they haven't mm -hmm. changed. <clears> or <throat> some other the underground tanks. One that's not here is uh -huh. um, there are some underground chambers that, that people use mainly to infiltrate large amounts of water into the ground. But you can wrap those in a pond liner and make that into an impervious a tank also. Oh. So it's a real specialty one. We do like one of those a year. Um, one thing to talk about just kind of as a concept is um, what we call conspicuous conservation. That, um, you know, this is not the 80s. We're not doing conspicuous uh, consumption, consumption anymore. Yeah. We do want to save the earth, but we kind of want everybody to know we're doing that, all right? <laughs> so there is some value in, um, you know, in showing that you're doing something like this. And so that might help with getting some of these tanks approved if they're pretty enough, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. So there, here are a couple of tanks. Um, the one on the right is the one I was telling you about, the Toyota dealership. Toyota dealership. Uh, oh. I, pull, I pulled this off their website. Really? <laughs> uh, the one on the left <laughs> is a functioning tank. Yeah. <laughs> the, the one on the left is a functioning tank in Austin, Texas. Uh -huh. That's right at a very busy, uh, long delay intersection. So people get a lot of time seeing the Starbucks copy logo and the fact that Starbucks is trying to save the earth. So here's the below ground when we talked about above ground, we talked about uh, some of these get into like the best place, the easiest place to flow the water is kind of in a low spot. Mm -hmm. So you can also pump the overflow if you need to. Um, and then these are the major components and I I think we've been over all of them already. Free filter, filters out the leaves, tank obviously, overflow, the calming inlets. Uh, also, when you're pumping, you don't want to pull the water right off the bottom, so you kind of raise it up a little bit. Uh, there are a couple of different ways of doing that. Um, for irrigation, like we're talking about today, that's all the filtration that you need. Uh, if you're going to drink the water, mm -hmm. um, City of Atlanta, again, um, has a is one of the few country, a uh, few cities in the country that has a plumbing code that prescribes how to treat rainwater for potable applications in oh. single family homes. So okay. you can follow that. That's a good way to do it. Uh, and then one of the things that we find that a lot of our customers uh, want is they want to meter that water. Yeah, you know, they want to see how much they're using this. It's exactly. kind of fun to to get some get some sort some of measurement numbers, yeah. right <laughs> to really see what we're doing right yeah. and maintenance um you know without getting too um proprietary i would say that they shouldn't require any maintenance more than you know once maybe twice a year if it's connected to an automatic irrigation system mm -hmm. you know once to <clears throat> in the fall when you shut down the irrigation and again making sure that everything works when you start it up again okay so not typically in winter you, you shut it off All shut right. it off yeah yeah, because not because you, you couldn't pump it, but um, there are some dangers in irrigating in the winter. You know, you get ice when you st spray oh, yeah. or the pipes in Georgia. They don't really set them all that low down into the to the ground and they can freeze they can and freeze. break. So right. it's really not an issue of the rainwater part of it. Uh, it's just the irrigation system in general. Right. This huge thing of water is not going to freeze in Georgia. There's there's just not enough. You know, it's not cold enough, long enough for the chemical reaction to happen for it to all turn to ice. Now you might get, you know, a little bit on the top, but that's not a problem. So when um, you talk about, uh, you know, making sure that the water is fresh and you clean it out at the end of the uh, in October. If I had a rain barrel, I'm sorry, I'm going back to rain barrels every right. time. <laughs> but if we had a rain barrel, that's one of the questions from our viewers that we're saying, mm -hmm. do they have to empty it out periodically to make sure that's, you know, during winter two reasons maybe mm -hmm. one is if if you don't if you don't clean the leaves out of here then or even if you do you can get little particles that could fall through here okay and um it may or may not this one does have an overflow on it 
Oh, right, I see the side. Yeah, the side spoke. <clears throat> but you don't have that. You don't have that calming inlet inside there. You got a basket filter, and then you've got no. There's no piping underneath this. Right. Okay. Okay. So that could be an issue, um, but if you're good about cleaning it out, it probably won't be a problem. Okay. But it's we, worth emptying it out to the winter, otherwise it's. Uh, I mean, it's not going to do anything, so you might as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. Up on the, uh, the screen now, you can see those different types of all the different German uh, water treatment. Right. Uh, and these are some other aspects that I talked about. That overflow, the, the device in the middle. Uh -huh. I think there's a way for me to point on this thing. Is this what you call a diverter kit? Or no? Because somebody's asked a question about a diverter kit. Okay, yeah, we'll talk about those okay. right now. I just, um, that is an overflow that has a little trap there right. that keeps mosquitoes from, from getting in and out. Uh, I do have, you want to switch back to camera? I've got... This is a first flush diverter that I think is what uh, the question is talking about. Mm -hmm. With this, the water goes in here. Uh, this is the inlet, this is the outlet. And then this device here is supposed to um, capture that first flush they talk about of water that, that would have the debris from the, from, the, the, um, from the roof and that sort of thing. And then down here, there's a little bleeder valve that's supposed to, um, and this ball right here, when, when this fills up with that debris filled water to begin with, it blocks all this dirty water and the clean water can then go this way. Um, they're a great concept. They work very poorly in practice. Um, despite them being very popular and we sell a lot of them on Amazon, I'll take the money, but I really don't like them. Um, I'm, a, I'm a part of the group that wrote the, the um, rainwater harvesting code okay. for the plumbing engineers. They did it in joint um, venture with the rainwater catchment uh, society. Everybody else on that committee said, take any reference to these things out of the code completely. Don't even talk about it. That's how many problems there are with them. That, um, it, you know, I mean- so the, What is the reason? I mean, is there something that we can- do Well, yeah. It? All right, so the, the point of this device was to capture that first bit of debris, right? Right. This is just a very small bleeder valve, you know, teeny tiny. It clogs up, either it clogs up with debris mm -hmm. and now it's not flushing that water. You just get stale water sitting in here, which goes into your tank. Or it's so open that you waste all your water there. Okay. So what you're supposed to do is after every rainfall, um, this unscrews. Okay. You unscrew that, you take it out, you put it back and nobody does it. So that's basically something if we, you know, the people used it correctly, then it would really work. Right. Okay, and it's not convenient. If I mean, people it's... paid attention, seat belts wouldn't be necessary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. So I'm an industrial engineer. You know, I design systems to work the way people actually operate. Absolutely. That's the problem with these. Um, remember that I was telling you about that one tank with the water quality that was better than city water. Right. And I didn't have one of these. That just had one of these screens here. Okay. Um, so. These are a problem, but they're very popular. And if you do all your technical training on rainwater harvesting on YouTube, you're going to see a lot of these. I would okay. recommend you don't do it. If you're going to do it, put this downstream of some other sort of screen like this. Okay. So now this catches most of the of the debris right. and just the really, really fine stuff that might actually get through that little orifice right. ends up in here. Okay. So it's the second, it's just back up to the, or well, the first one. One, we got the calming in it, we right. got the overflow, and we got the pump thing. Okay. So there are already four that are making water that's cleaner than city water. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and I did another test. The uh, We did the, the rainwater to potable system at the Candida building at Georgia Tech. Uh-huh. I mean, that's also, does not have a first flush device. Okay. Our, also, our water in the tank is cleaner than the city water. And if you know the location, it's a mile from the treatment plant. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> so rainwater, you don't you don't need this. Okay. I'll take your money, but I'd rather you not have it. Uh, okay. So I'm going to go back to. Yeah, you're still on presentation, right? Alicia. 
You should. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. First of all, I gotta go here. There. All right. So that's water treatment. Talked about pumping. There are a couple of different ways to do that. This is all my expertise. Nobody cares about it except me. Uh, if you want to talk later for a couple of hours, I can talk about pumping. <laughs> <laughs> so the your I mean the this one your expertise to talk about pumping the water inside the barrel so that it keeps it clean and keeps the no uh, no to distribute it to distribute it distribute okay. it to connect it to an automatic irrigation system to interact with city water when you run out okay. of rainwater all that okay yeah so here's my list of things to avoid and we've already covered all these the IBC totes mm -hmm. because they grow algae there's the first flush device and then on the right are the free syrup uh, yep. bottles I mean if you paint them black they'll be okay yeah. And it's, it's an okay way to start. Um, this is now in the presentation. I've got some links at the end that okay. can take you to right to uh, this guide. And this is a, this is a pretty good design of how to do it. Excellent. And then if you really want to geek out or you're a professional watching this, uh, arxa.org is the website for the professional society that I was telling you about. Right. And they offer a specialty certification in rainwater harvesting that really focuses on residential, really residential potable, but covers kind of all of it. Oh, okay. So that is my presentation. Excellent. You want to take it back to camera? Yeah, I, I mean, this has been wonderful. It's been a wealth of knowledge that you've shared with us. I hope not too much. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I mean, I think all of us are ready to kind of absorb this knowledge okay. and figure out how we can make it happen for all of us. Why just, you know, we have the volunteers collating the questions from the different um, you know, platforms that we're on. Okay. So while they do that, I just have, um, you know, I want to talk a minute about um, the Green Cells other effort that we do, one of our other projects. In fact, we have a volunteer right here, Danish, who um, has is working on the AG, um, what do you call it? Plant grow, a plant to grow initiative that's run out of Alfred Rocco Farm, and um, where they actually have a plot of land right here in this open farm, where they grow vegetables, and this is distributed to the um, uh, food rescue places. And we also have, uh, you know, him getting all of us involved in the green cell, and all our volunteers. We don't have a spot here, but we have backyard gardens where we grow our vegetables. So any surplus that we have. We have a run that's done every week and we collect the vegetables and hand it over to uh, this initiative. So if any of you all are out there and have a garden and you have surplus growing and you want to get involved with this, please do reach out to us again on our website or on Facebook or just send us an email, greencellatl at gmail.com and we'll give you all the details. Um, yeah, and now this is a few questions. Any um, Lata, were there any other questions? I don't. Um, so one thing was uh, about um, filtering the um, water, rainwater for drinking water. There's nothing. Is there any specific system to do that that you would suggest? Uh, yeah, re real briefly. Uh, if you were in an emergency situation uh -huh. and you took water out of your uh, your your cistern that had all these different methods we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you could pour the water through a Brita type pitcher. Okay. And that carbon would make it clean enough to drink. Okay. Um, but typically, we use uh, ultraviolet light, mm -hmm. which you can also see in some like camping water sterilization things. Okay. Ultraviolet sterilizes between the UV and the carbon, they catch pretty they catch. much everything. Right. Yeah, it's organic. Alum, is it? I, I don't know why I remember alum being used to. Um, there's a salt, right? I don't, I don't know about I, alum. Something triggers my memory on that. And you can use four, you can use bleach. It's real easy to use too much bleach. Oh, okay. You can use iodine. It tastes like iodine. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to so, go there. Yeah, the, the standard one is some sort of sediment filter, UV, and then carbon okay. is the way we do most residential. I do have a question. Yeah, perfect. So we have a question right from Studio our audience. audience. <laughs> so I do have a setup where I'm collecting water. Uh, rainwater um, in a barrel like that. Mm -hmm. But let's say if you set this up um, and and um, you collect rainwater, uh, is there a way you can switch um, 
you can switch the water to come from this and once once it goes down a level switch back to the automated system through the pipes because mm -hmm. i've got an automated yeah. system if going you go onto our website you'll see some schematics that show that but uh, generally the way we do it is um you've got a pressure regulating valve that's kind of that's supplying to whatever you're trying to use some sort of minimum pressure and then we set our, our pump to provide more than that. So if the PRV is set for 30 PSI and the pump puts out 40 PSI, the PRV never opens. You run out of water, the pump starts, stops running, the pressure goes down, the PRV opens. This is an automated way to, right. to set that up so that uh, it switches back to the regular uh, right. water cycle yeah. yeah and it's all technology that everybody knows how to use awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's one Peter, more question. we do have a oh, zoom really question this um if someone's asked a question about lake water for irrigation I don't, uh, what should i do to uh, get lake water to use so lake water is um falls into that you know storm water it gets it gets a, has a lot of sediment in it in some right. cases uh, and you've got to be prepared for that. Uh, I don't know enough about it to say how dirty lake water, pond water, river water is. Right. Um, but really, that'd be the only thing is to. I got some great ten thousand dollar products okay. that will filter that <laughs> well enough. But I, there's probably a, a less expensive way to do right. it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, is there any other questions from the audience that's listening to us on any of our um, platforms? Geeta, there's a question from Zoom. Um, Deepa is asking the okay. underground system that he was showing. Yeah. Does does the does your company install it? Is what their question is. We're not an installer. Um, okay. We have some. If you go on our website, there are we have some preferred contractors that we work with. But if they were, if, if that was a you know, if you had an existing house, you weren't doing any other work, you just wanted to install a rainwater system, they would be a good choice. If you're building a new house, then our, our mission is, and our premise is that this is something that a site work contractor that, that has the excavator on site already um, could and should know how to do. It's a septic tank. So we'll show them how to set it up correctly for rainwater harvesting. Yeah, excellent. I don't All think right. we have any other questions. But again, thank you so much for this very, very informative webinar. Okay. And um, yeah, I think we should, um, for the audience, if there's any other questions you'll think of and um, want to ask, please do reach out to us either on Facebook, Green Cell ATL, or you can send us an email again, it's Green Cell ATL at gmail.com. We have a website, Green Cell ATL.com. And um, so let us know what your thoughts are. The other thing is we'll have a survey that's being sent out. So um, please do take a minute to answer the survey. That will help us in planning future webinars that would be of use to you. And the way we plan these webinars over the months of summer is so that we can handhold you through the whole process of summer in your garden. So we did something on uh, seedlings, starting seedlings. Then we had uh, growing your, you know, setting up your spring garden. We had vermicomposting. I mean, actually driven by Maganesh. And um, then this month we have our rainwater harvesting because we know Atlanta has copious rains. And the next month's webinar, which is, uh, if you can go to the next slide, uh, Lata, um, is on um, taking this rainwater from your rain barrel, say, or from wherever, basically automating the process of uh, drip irrigation to your beds. So that is supposed to be the most efficient way of watering your uh, beds without any wastage of water and keep getting your um, you know, bank for your buck in terms of economy of water usage. So next month, do uh, tune in and join us for our webinar. That's on June 13th. And uh, that presentation will be done by Sashikant Vellum. And um, it's going to be another very interesting, informative learning webinar. So look forward to joining to all of you are joining us there. Thank you and have a great rest of the Sunday. <laughs>